There are really three things that we need to talk about in, in verse 1. We need to talk about the, the being of God, who God is. We need to talk about what God did. And we need to talk about when He did it. And we've, we've taken a little time to talk about the being of God and the philosophical objections to the idea of God which, which come from atheism. We'll, con we'll continue doing that. But I want to now shift a little bit and talk about what He did. He created the heavens and the earth. Now the Hebrew phrase, heavens and earth, Hashemayim Eretz, basically means everything. That's the way you say everything in Hebrew. You say Hashemayim Eretz, the heavens and the earth. What else is there? but the heavens and the earth. The heavens, everything over us and the earth, everything around us and under us. God created everything over us, everything around us, everything under us. That is, God created everything. Now let's go back to the atheist point of view for just a minute while we talk about that. Until the 20th century, the majority of science, scientists believed in what they call the, st the steady state theory. Uh, and there are some scientists who still believe in that. And basically what that means is that matter is eternal. In other words, the universe that we see when we look through the telescopes has always been here. Let me just say that that's impossible. Because if the universe has, had been here for an eternity, the fuel which allows the stars to burn would have flamed out long ago because the fuel is not infinite. So it's impossible. Now, not for that reason, well, in the 20th century, more and more scientists came to uh, an alternate theory, naturalistic theory of origins called the Big Bang. And the Big Bang lines up pretty well with Genesis 1-1, but the scientists, you see, refuse to recognize a creative agent that is a personal creator. The Big Bang is a way of saying, we know there was a beginning but we can't explain it. Now, let's think about what that means in terms of time. When did it happen? Well, let me just say that all uh, cosmologists, secular cosmologists, believe that the universe is 12 to 14 billion years old. And they do that, they, they conclude that by measuring the, um, the outer periphery, the outer rim of the receding stars, the stars that are going away from us. Maybe I should call a timeout right here and, and say something. I'm not a scientist. I'm a Bible student, okay? And before you, and this, what I'm about to say makes some Christians angry but I'm going to say it anyway. Before you make up your mind on these issues, you would do well to understand two things. You need to understand the position of a, an evolutionist who is a real Christian. There are lots of evolutionists who are real Christians. Christians. You need to understand their arguments, okay? You also need to understand the argument of a real scientist who's a creationist, a real scientist who does not believe in evolution. Now, there are many fewer in that category than there are in the first category, but here's the interesting thing. There are some, there are some people in that category who are not Christians. There are some real scientists who are not Christians who don't believe in evolution for totally secular scientific grounds. 
that have nothing to do with religion because they don't believe in religion. And you would do well to understand these arguments. Now, I'm, I'm neither. You know, I'm just a Christian who is a creationist who does not believe in evolution, but I'm not a scientist. So my opinion is not that important. Because I don't really understand science, maybe if I did understand science, it would be a bigger problem for me. But because, because I'm not a scientist, I can only parrot what I hear. I can hear this person say this and this person say that, and then I can regurgitate it and echo it and say it back to you. But then if you challenge me and take me deeper, I don't have anything to say. Maybe I can do that a little bit with theology. We'll see. But I certainly can't do it with science. So I want to humbly share these things, saying that there are other kinds of people whose positions you need to understand besides me. But it's necessary that we talk about this a little bit because it's like we have an army and our army is marching and you're the Christian army and I'm, I'm urging you to march for your great king and your great commander. But it would be very foolish of me to do that if I pretended that you weren't under attack. We march a little bit differently when we're under attack. So I can't just teach you these things and pretend that we're not under attack. I have to talk a little bit about our enemies who, who are attacking us. And let me say this about time. What I started to say a while ago is that the cosmologists believe that the, the universe is about um, 12 to 14 billion years old and that, that life is about 4.5 billion years old. Well, if I were more of a scientist, maybe I would be more attracted to that point of view. And maybe what I'm about to say, I'm only saying because I don't know very much about science, but let me just say this, okay? God created the universe with the appearance of age. God created the trees. God created the giant redwood trees. Now, one minute after creation, maybe that redwood tree had 400 rings, but that didn't prove it's 400 years old. God created Adam an adult. And one minute after Adam is created, maybe he looked 25 years old, but he was only 25 seconds old. The greatest natural site to visit in the United States is the Grand Canyon. There's no more natural site more interesting to visit in the United States than the Grand Canyon. And they calculate the age of the Grand Canyon by saying that the Colorado River displaces soil at a certain rate every year. So you measure how deep the Grand Canyon is and you calculate from how many years it would take to make it that deep and therefore that's the age of the Grand Canyon. That's only true if God created the world like a billiard ball. But God did not create the world like a billiard ball. God created the world with mountains and canyons and seas with the appearance of age. Now, there's another thing that's even more important. We're going to learn in, on the fourth day of creation, verses 14 to 19, I think, in Genesis 1, we're going to learn that God made the lights in the heavens for man. Here's what that means. It means that the God who created the light and localized the light in the stars and in the heavenly bodies was not forced to wait billions of years for the light of the furthest stars to reach the pupil of man, the eyeball of man. The same God who created the light and localized the light in the star was perfectly capable of creating light in between the star and the eye of man.
there are three things that happen in the book of Genesis, which means that we cannot take an accurate measurement. One is creation itself. We don't, we don't even know for sure that the speed of light was a constant at the moment of creation. The measures only work if all the constants which are true now abided at the moment of creation, but the moment of creation is a special moment. There are actually four events in the book of Genesis that mean we cannot take an accurate measurement. One is creation itself, the other is the fall. The fall upset things. The things that we see now are not the things that were seen before the fall. The things which exist now are not the things which existed before the fall. We'll talk about that when we get to chapter 3. So there's creation, there's the fall, there's the flood, and there's the judgment at the Tower of Babel. We'll talk about that in chapter 11, how that changes things and how that can corrupt the measurements. So. Let me say this. I'm not saying how old I think the earth is. Anthropologists who are not basing what they say on cosmology or even on biology, anthropologists tell us we got to have a hundred thousand years for the way the races have changed. Well, we'll talk about that when we get to Genesis 11. Um, I interpret Genesis pretty literally, and I'm undistracted by what scientists say because I don't know much about science, but also because I trust the Scripture. Um, I do believe that the earth is young. I don't believe that it has to be as young as 10 or 12,000 years old for Scripture to be true. I suppose it could be a bit older than that. I doubt very much if it's over 100,000 years old. I certainly don't believe that the universe is 12 billion years old. Now, maybe it is. But if it is, it's not because there are things about science that I don't understand. It's because there are things about the Scripture that I don't understand. Do you understand that distinction? The reason I admit that the universe could be billions of years old is not because I'm impressed with what science teaches. It's because I'm painfully aware of my capacity to misunderstand what the Scripture is saying. Okay? We have to have an authority, and I've got mine. And we'll talk about that in chapter 3, okay? TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TBS Ministry. For more information, please visit tbsseminary.com. But if Genesis is true, you can't measure it because it's not going at the same rate it's always gone, gone in. Creation produced a different rate. The fall produced a different rate. The flood may have impacted the rate, and the judgment at Babel may have impacted the rate anthropologically. We'll talk about that when we get to chapter 11. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, verse 2, we're already in verse 2. Verse 2 is also very much tied up with these controversies about time. And let me say what I mean by that. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void. The Hebrew words are tohu wabohu, without form or shape. That's tohu and empty. That's bohu. 
and we're going to see that the successive days of creation, we're going to talk about what is a day, what could a day be before there was the sun. On the successive days of creation, God addresses these problems of tohu, no form, bohu, no fullness. What does God do about that? But first we're going to talk about a bigger controversy. Here's what many Christians believe. Many Christians believe that there was an enormous incalculable gap of time which passed between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. This is called the Genesis Gap Theory. And I want to be very fair because some very, very good people believe this. Um, I believe that most people believe this because of pressure from science. I believe that most Christians are attracted to the gap theory because it makes, us, it, makes it easier for us in a biblical way to account for the apparent vast age of the universe. But the arguments are not, the, and, the, and, and, not but, but, and the arguments are made from Scripture. Now, I've got to tell you something that's very, very important. There were Christians who believed in the gap theory before 1859. 1859 was the year that Darwin published The Origin of the Species. I happen to have all the sermons ever published by Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great Baptist in London who died in 1892. He's my favorite preacher. In my opinion, he's the greatest man ever to preach in English. I have a sermon which he preached before 1859 in which he allows for the possibility of the gap theory. Why would that argument appeal to Christians, especially Christians before 1859, who would have had no scientific motivation to believe in a gap theory? Well, here's why. Genesis 1-1 said that God created the heavens and the earth. But verse 2 says everything was chaos. You know, we have these two Greek words, cosmos, which means an orderly world, and chaos, which means disorder and randomness and anarchy and a mess. So here's the argument. If God created everything, if God created the universe in verse 1, he wouldn't have created the mess we have in verse 2. Therefore, something happened in the gap between verses 1 and verse 2 which messed everything up. And the suggestion is it was the angelic rebellion led by Lucifer. And that's what messed everything up. Now, there are actually some verses which are appealed to outside the book of Genesis. And, and I hope you have a Bible, and I want you to turn to those verses. We'll just look at three verses. Um, one is Isaiah 45, 18. Isaiah 45, 18, which says, I'll go ahead and tell you the other places so you can write them down and you won't have to uh, take time uh, another place is Jeremiah 4.23, and maybe we'll look at Isaiah 34.11. I don't know if we'll look at that one or not. I've got to look at it again before I decide. But the first one is Isaiah 45.18. Here's what Isaiah 45.18 says. Thus said the Lord who created the heavens, He is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it, and did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. So this verse could be appealed to and say what God made in verse Genesis 1-1 one, one, 
is not what we see in Genesis 1-2. Because he did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. Okay, um, next verse. Uh, Jeremiah 4, verse 23. Jeremiah 4, 23. I looked on the earth, and behold, it was, same Hebrew words, tohu wabohu. It was formless and void into the heavens, and they had no light. I look, look at verse 25. I looked, and behold, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens had fled. Um, this reference is imported to suggest that something terrible uh, has happened, which has rendered the world formless and void. If you are compelled by the scientific evidence and you believe that the scientific evidence is, is overwhelming and it leaves us with no options, but to believe that the universe is billions of years old, um, then I think this is a good option for you. I think if you want to interpret Genesis 1, 1 and 2 this way. Let me just say that I don't think that's what it means. Um, I'll just say a couple of things here. Um, God, when we read Genesis 1, and when, when we look at ourselves and we realize that we are made in God's image, it's obvious that God is, is a great engineer. It's obvious that God is a great mathematician. It's also obvious that God is a great artist. He's a great artist. And um, in a minute, we're going to talk about the successive creative days and what that means. One reason God created time was so that everything wouldn't happen all at once. I'm, I'm not an engineer or an artist. I wish I was. But I think both engineers and artists would tell us that part of the pleasure is in the process, not just the product that if an engineer could build a building or an airplane or a ship or a bridge in one day, he wouldn't because that would take the fun out of it. And that if the artist could render the painting in one minute, he wouldn't because he wouldn't, he wouldn't feel the pleasure. And we go back to Michelangelo. He just throws that clay out there and it's a big mess and then he starts to touch it. And he makes it into something beautiful and something meaningful. And God is an artist. And it doesn't mean that he created chaos and something terrible and awful just because he began. Just because it was chaotic and formless and void when he began. That's one reason I'm not attracted to the gap theory, okay? The other reason I'm not a attracted to the gap theory, and the main reason I'm not a attracted to the gap theory is because the purpose of revelation is to reveal, not to obscure. The reason God spoke through Moses to tell us about this is to uncover the reality, not to cover the reality up, not to hide some secret, some unspoken secret between verse 1 and verse 2. Now remember, there are wonderful Bible-believing Christians who believe in the gap theory. I'm not speaking against them. I'm not sure that they're wrong but I think they're wrong for those two reasons. Because first, I don't think it means that God made a mess. I think it means that God was an artist who began. And first, He created the raw material. He did not create the finished product. 
he created the raw material, which looked like a mess until he finished the creation. Okay? So I don't think that's a very good argument to say that, oh, he wouldn't have created a mess. But the second reason has to do with the very nature of Scripture itself. Why are we given Genesis 1? So that these things could be revealed to us, not so these things could be hidden from us. The earth was formless and void, and darkness moved across the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Now, it's a peculiarity in both the Greek and the Hebrew languages that the word for spirit in Hebrew and Greek is also the word for breath. And the word for spirit in Hebrew and Greek is also the word for wind. We can continually ask the question, well, here's the spirit of God. Um, and we've already noted that the word for God is a plural. And we're going to note other things even in chapter 1. How does, how do the Jews who are Unitarians, who accuse us of being polytheists, we are not polytheists, we are monotheists, but we are Trinitarian monotheists, how do they deal with the fact that the very Spirit of God shows up in verse 2? And how do you distinguish the Spirit of God from God Himself? We do it within a Trinitarian Godhead. They say this was the wind of God or that it is God Himself, the Spirit. But that's just another way of saying God the Father. The Spirit of God was also a creative agency just as the Logos of God, the second person, the Lord Jesus Christ, was also a creative agency according to John 1.1 1, 1, and according to Colossians um, 1.16. The Spirit moved over at the surface of the waters. So evidently, the waters on the earth were one of the things that was created in verse 1. But there's darkness. And God says, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. Now, um, what we're going to see is that there is symmetry that there's a balance between the first three creative days and the second three creative days. But our time is up on this tape, so we'll do that next. Okay? Thanks.